This is March 9th, 2018, yes. and we're talking to George Mugenbeck, who is the Town of Iceland historian, and he is going to talk to us about two women uh, who are connected to Oakdale, and they are Alva Vanderbilt and Isabella Prem. Both are actually sort of connected to each other because they're both associated with the Vanderbilt Idol Hour yes. estate. And so, George, who would you like to start with? Um, you know what? I, I think we're going to start with, with Alva because uh, the story of Isabella is more modern and actually is a result of what Alva, Alva did. Um, Alva Belmont is an interesting person. Uh, for many, many reasons, and I, this is part of the display, and I'm, I'm using this to kind of make sure I don't miss anything for you, but uh, she was born in Alabama prior to the Civil War in 1853, and from the very beginning, she was kind of a rebel, a female rebel, not, you know, Civil War type rebel. She rebelled against the strictures of, uh, of the society of the time, where the young lady had to be very proper, white-gloved, was drinking tea on the porch. Um, she said that she realized that uh, women didn't have equal rights and treatment when she was admonished as a young child for running and climbing trees, and she was told that young ladies do not do that. Uh, she was then... Uh, during the Civil War, she actually went to France, where she was educated. And after the war, she came back and she lived in New York City. It was there that she met uh, William, uh, Vander William K. Vanderbilt. And in 1875, they're married. Now, uh, people didn't take her as seriously as they should have because she ran the biggest parties, spent the most money, and you know, it was a great thing to be invited to her mansion, which was the most incredible mansion on Fifth Avenue. So it looked as if that she was a typical spoiled, rotten child of wealth and privilege. She doesn't really break out of this society hostess mold during that portion of her life. At just in that same thing, it Islip is developing as a resort destination. Prior to the Civil War, we had a lot of men come out from the city to spend a week to go hunting and fishing, and this was wonderful. Oh, it was a great place. Except you couldn't get here from there. Right after the Civil War, the railroad comes through and reaches here in the 18, uh, late 1860s, 1868. And so now, the South Side Railroad of Long Island could bring you right to any location in Iceland. And you see newspaper advertisements for guides from Sayville and the wonderful area of uh, Oakdale, which at that time was still called Riverside because that was the name of the uh, Ludlow Estate. They went ahead and many of the people came out and they started staying at the Southside Sportsman's Club, which they had paid the buy from the Snedekor family, which had been uh, you know, a hotel and all that catered to them. And they built an apartment building, and, and not what we would think of an apartment, but, but large, spacious places. So their families could come out with them because the families were saying, listen, you're going out there for a week, uh, what's going on? So they would go out there and the men would hunt and the women would, women would sit and eat, drink tea. And eventually what happened is the women say, hey, listen, we're living in what they considered squalor. So they started building hunting lodges. Now, we have one existing example of the original hunting lodge, which is uh, the Bayard Cutting. Uh, Arboretum. That house uh, is itself actually was mirrored more or less by what William K. Vanderbilt built originally at Idlehour. Very similar European hunting lodge, very German, very English, 
uh, gentry type hunting lodge. Alma, uh, Al, excuse me, Alva and uh, William K. spent a good deal of the summers out there with a the boat on the on the Great South Bay. They go fishing and hunting and so forth. In 1895, uh, William K. and you get a kind of feeling that Alva kicked over the traces, so to speak, with her attitudes and, and ideas and the fact that she was a very strong woman. Uh, William K. wanted to divorce her. Only trouble is that wasn't as easy as it sounds. So he comes up with a plot. He has a woman he's going to want to marry. But rather than getting her involved, uh, the simple thing is, is he comes up with a French a uh, courtesan who he puts up in Paris and, and in luxury and everything else, and everybody thinks she is the paramour. Well, she isn't. It, it's, it's a canard, so uh, Alva would act, and Alva did act, and she divorced him. Only I don't think William K. realized that she wasn't going to be the uh, quiet little lady that would go away, because uh, Alva goes ahead, and at one of her statements, she wrote later, she said, I was one of the first women in America to dare to criticize openly an influential man's behavior. And she got a settlement in that divorce, which was the largest divorce settlement up to that time, and I'm not even sure we've made it since then. She got an immediate payout of $2.3 million, an annual income for life of $100,000 uh, per year, and this is when the dollar was, was very strong and the deed to their home in Newport, Rhode Island, which was called Marble House, it's still there, you can tour it. And Marble House is an incredible piece of architecture, and it will come into play shortly after that. Um, in 1896, she then marries Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont. Uh, again, married into a another large fortune he will eventually die and she inherits that fortune, so she becomes probably the richest woman in the world. Now, most people would say, with that kind of wealth, she's going to sit back and do nothing. And oh, by the way, she also got complete custody of the children. Uh, and we could go into the story of Consuela and everything else and the fact that married an English lord, which we'll play in a little later, uh, which was an unhappy marriage, but that has to do with idle hour the hunting lodge burning down, and the present idle hour that we know today being built. Um, she was always supportive of women's rights, especially the right to vote, but she stayed, as she put it, on the bench until Oliver Hazard, uh, Perry Belmont dies. Uh, I don't know, I don't believe from what her writings say that there was a problem. She just did not want to create problems when he was alive. And she quietly, as he did, quietly supported the movement. But she went into depression after he died and pulled herself out of depression. And it's very interesting because the same thing happened to uh, another Islip resident uh, who worked with her kind of thing. After their husbands died, they went into a deep depression because they truly loved the second husband. In any case, uh, she reads an article in 1909, and she says, I have to take action. So what she does is she goes to talk to the people that are running the women's suffrage uh, movement. That was the North American Women's Suffrage Association. We hear so much of the people from upstate uh, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and all those, they really didn't accomplish anything. They were a uh, parlor tea group that would get there and talk genteely to congressmen. And they've been doing this some, in some cases before the Civil War, but definitely after the Civil War. But not much had happened. A few states had granted uh, suffrage, but the rest hadn't even bothered. Alva Belmont, being a businesswoman, which she really was, figured out that one of the major problems is, is they were headquartered in Warren, Ohio, which most people couldn't even find in a map. So she went ahead and bought 505 Fifth Avenue, which was 
two build, uh, a building away from the corner of 5th and 42nd. And she made that the woman's suffrage headquarters building, moving the headquarters of uh, NAWAS, which the North American Women's Suffrage Association, and every other women's suffrage association she could find, and women's rights organ, she gave them free office space. In addition, she painted the building with large signs about women's suffrage, and it became something that people passed every day at the crossroads, basically, of New York City. So um, that was her first stunt. And in August of uh, 1909, she opened Marble House for tours, which horrified the rest of the people in Newport, Rhode Island. This was just not done. But what she did for the tours was you would pay for the tour, and then you might get some tea and crumpets out of the lawn while you got a lecture on women's suffrage. And oh, by the way, all the pamphlets that came with it just happened to mention women's <laughs> suffrage. And while you're on the tour, she would appear and talk about women's suffrage. So she was making money for the suffrage movement and basically providing people wanted to see this incredible house. So it was a way to get a new audience for the movement. Uh, one of her next stunts was uh, it, it, prior to the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist fire in, in 1911, uh, there was a garment workers strike. And the garment workers were being treated very badly and, and what Alva decided to do was she said they needed an organization meeting to really get organized. So she hires uh, the New York Hippodrome, which was kind of the Madison Square Garden of the day, and gets 8,000 potential and union members in there to listen to speeches supposedly on joining a union. Only trouble is there were very few speeches on organizing the union. The speeches, and especially hers, was on the women, women's rights. And of course, being that the audience was mainly women, uh, this went over very well. In addition, the pictures of this auditorium show women's rights posters and banners everywhere. So Alva was also a very brilliant salesperson. She must have been to sell that divorce. And she, she really then organized something, was a boycott of non-union made clothing. Again, something that horrified our own children, let alone the, uh, the, the people who uh, the, the people of her class. Um, she also founded the same year something called the Political Equality League. She realized that the women's suffrage unit uh, movement, excuse me, was only a movement of white, upper middle, and upper class women. That the immigrant women, black women, and so forth were left out of the movement. So. She wanted it gained as a right for all women. So what she did was that she bought up or leased various and sundry buildings around New York City, which she called them suffrage settlement houses, like the settlement houses that would have been in the Lower East Side. And this is a place for a woman to go who might be poor, who might be an immigrant, who might be African American, to sit down with other women and have tea and cake, just like the fancy women, and, by the way, discuss women's rights. And there'd be plenty of literature there. And this is where she gets involved with Alice Paul and all the other major leaders of the movement that we know of. She's in the back of this, funding all of this going on. Um, she also opened her own homes, and she had a number of them because she liked to build these things for women to come out and spend a weekend in the country and she would provide a housekeeper to take care of that woman's family while the woman was out in the country supposedly relaxing and oh by the way getting a lecture on women's suffrage and women's rights. Um, the big breakthrough and the change in the movement came a few years later in 1914. She goes to England to visit her daughter Consuela. The marriage to the English earls and uh, lord uh, Again, this was typical of the rich families where fortunes would be transferred into the, uh, the American girl would get a title and the, the man would get money to support the family because they were being taxed pretty heavily over there. She goes over there and not only does she talk to her daughter and sees what she can do to 
uh, make her daughter happier, she also gets to talk to uh, the heads of what was known. And remember, in America, we the women were suffragists. In England, they were suffragettes. We never used the term suffragettes in America, even though we see it move, used in all the movies and all. It, it was incorrect. The suffragette movement in England was a lot more violent. And that particular movement uh, influenced her because she saw that the active tactics uh, might not work in England because there was a problem getting through to Parliament and, and, and the males holding on to the reins. But in America, it would shock people. So she brings Mrs. Pankhurst, who headed the movement in England, over to America. Mrs. Pankhurst is arrested the minute she arrives in America and placed in jail be because she's a, she's a terrorist. Alva gets her out. And Alva gets her to talk to people like Alice Paul, Lucy Burns, and we start seeing the women's suffrage unit with women being arrested, sent to jail, and uh, basically the movement protesting in front of the White House. We have another Islip resident who also helped fund it, uh, which is Louisine Havemeyer. Louisine, who was in her 60s, goes ahead and sets fire to a straw dummy of the President of the United States, gets herself arrested and thrown in jail. And while she doesn't spend a lot of time in there, she goes ahead and funds the train that goes around with women in prison shifts. And that really pushes the 19th Amendment along. Uh, she was, she financed, uh, Alva Belmont financed all of this picketing and everything else, made sure the women had, uh, their families were taken care of and so forth. And she wrote many articles, she wrote uh, booklets, letters, she made many speeches. And uh, in 1921, she becomes president of the uh, Women's, National Women's Party. Now, they don't have a headquarters. Everybody else has got a place in Washington. So what she does is she buys a home in Washington, which just happens to be right down the street from the Capitol building. To this day, you can go visit that home. It is now in 19, uh, 19, 2016. Uh, Barack Obama declared it a national landmark, and it's the uh, Belmont Paul House. Uh, she continued fighting for women's rights, the Equal Right Amendment, and all sorts of other things through her life. She did pass away in 1933. Uh, she was in France at the time, and she was just had just turned 80. Uh, the interesting fact about Alva Belmont is that in spite of getting the New York State Suffrage Amendment passed in 1917, and driving force behind getting the 19th Amendment through, she never voted. She swore she would never vote until there was a woman nominated for the position of President of the United States. So Alva Smith Belmont never uh, never voted, this, but she is responsible for getting women the rights to vote. And again, this is another one of those hidden history of Islip things that two women from Islip, uh, Alva Smith Vanderbilt Belmont and of Idlehour, and uh, uh, Louisine Havemeyer of Islip were two of the great moving factors and funders of the successful women's right to vote campaign in the United States. By the way, the suffragists got the right to vote long before the suffragettes in England got the right to vote. So that's another very interesting piece. And the key to the change was, of course, New York State granting, on the second try, granting women the right to vote. That was the largest state in the Union. And Alva Belmont and Louisine Havemeyer both realized that. If they could get one large state to do this, then the rest would fall like dominoes. And the, the story goes, and whether it's apocryphal or true, was that uh, in Tennessee was the last state to ratify. They had only hours before the time would run out for ratification of the amendment. And the Tennessee legislature was set to vote, and it was definite that it was going to go down to defeat by one vote. And apparently, the uh, a young Tennessee uh, representative got a note from his mother 
saying, remember that I'm your mother and I can't vote. And so he changed his vote and Tennessee ratified. And at that moment, they, they threw down the flag that they had built, uh, women's with the stars, the gold stars for each state. And that had, you know, all the states on it. And Alice Paul, Louisine Havemeyer, Alva Belmont, and uh, Lucy Burns were all there for that. So, you know, that apocryphal story, but we, we can say that Oakdale had a lot to do with getting women the right to vote in this country. And yes, she left, uh, she probably left here in 1896 or so, but her heart was still in this area because she loved, loved the bays and, and, and so forth. And she did live on Long Island uh, during the rest of her life. So interesting lady. Very interesting.